Okay, thank you for having me. Um, it's great to be back here. I've never quite managed to leave in a certain sense, and it's nice uh, that, that's, that it's that way. Um, Richard asked me to give an overview of the state of the art, which is, of course, a ridiculous request for this type of area, because it's not art, it's mathematics, and it's not a state, so it should be, I should give an overview of the flux of the mathematics, I guess. So, in, in response to it, I thought that only a ridiculous uh, title for the talk would be appropriate, so all of causal discovery, um, also as a little homage to, uh, us, uh, to CMU here, because uh, the moment the title went up on the website, uh, Larry Wasserman sent me an email saying, I was infringing copyright uh, with his uh, book, um, All of Statistics, uh, which you might well know, and he said, He'll take payment in alcohol or dollars, so uh, you know, someone take the Macallan over to him later, please. <laughs> the, the other reason, of course, why I wanted to talk about all of, uh, or all of causality is that Larry has engaged in a very useful way of thinking about this, is that you write one book of all of statistics, and then you write a book on a subset of that that is almost <laughs> as large, uh, which is to suggest that you know, I'm going to do all of, causa all of causality today, and you will realize that actually uh, we'll write another whole book on a subset which is going to be much larger than the rest of it. So with apologies to all the things that I will not cover today, uh, I will try and give you some idea of the ideas that have come up recently in the methodology of causal discovery and some of the state of the art you've already seen today in action before. So here's the kind of picture that I want to have just to get us all on the same page. Let's assume that we have some true underlying causal model with uh, over a set of variables. And we investigate that type of causal model in different circumstances. They might be observational, where we intervene on a certain variable. They might be, uh, sorry, they might be observational. We might not observe all the variables that uh, we would like to. Or we might uh, investigate the system with experiments where we manipulate one variable or several at the same time. And then we get data samples from these different experimental conditions. And then from those data samples, the causal search algorithm is really the challenge to recover from there the causal structure. But what is crucial, of course, in the causal search algorithm is what type of assumptions go in. And so one of the set of the standard assumptions that we often see and have seen today are the causal Markov faithfulness assumption, the acyclicity, linearity, some kind of restriction on the type of distribution that we're going to consider. And there are a whole pile of other assumptions that one might consider, and I'll say something about how they fit together. And from that, we are supposed to then infer either maybe something like an equivalence class of causal structures, or maybe specific parameters, or whether particular edges are there or absent, or whether particular pairs of variables are confounded. So this is the overall picture that I'm hoping to work with today. So then in a particular example, for example, the PC algorithm where we have an observational data sample, what do we use as the assumptions that go in? We say it's causal Markov, causal faithfulness. We assume that there are no latent variables, causal sufficiency. And we assume that the graph is acyclic. And then you all know, or I would think most of you know, that what we get out uh, uh, at best is a Markov equivalence class so that, for example, we only know that one of the graph of the three that I've listed there uh, can be true about the set of variables uh, that we've measured. So I don't know how many of you were there uh, this morning for the tutorial where Richard might have mentioned uh, some of these things uh, explicitly and a little more carefully. I just want to uh, make sure that we're all on the same page with regard to the assumptions that I'll be mentioning today. If you don't know causal Markov, the precise definition will not help you now. So the basic idea of uh, the causal Markov is that it uh, permits an inference from probabilistic dependence to causal connection. And in a certain sense, causal faithfulness is the converse of that, that it allows you uh, an inference from probabilistic independence to causal separation. So in particular, in that graph in the bottom there, uh, what you wouldn't want to happen, or what faithfulness excludes, is that uh, it doesn't work. Is that uh, these two uh, these two pathways should not cancel out. So you would not want the pathway via x, y, z to cancel out exactly with the pathway to x, z to make the variables independent, even though they're causally connected. Causal sufficiency means that we assume that there are no unmeasured common causes. So for example, these cases here where L1 and L2 should not occur if we assume causal sufficiency, we 
assume these things away, as uh, I think Kevin uh, used that uh, assumption quite explicitly in one of his models earlier. And then acyclicity, which has been used a lot and debated a lot already, is that we don't allow for cycles and feedback loops within our data. So just these are the general type of assumptions that I want to work with. OK, so then we can ask, well, under these assumptions that take Markov faithfulness, causal sufficiency, and acyclicity, what type of algorithms do we have that give us the Markov equivalence class? Well, the PC algorithm is one. There are lots of variants that were mentioned today to make it more robust. Uh, but there are also others, like the GES algorithm, which is a greedy Bayesian type of approach that you can use, which uh, came up, I think, in the first talk today. Um, and there are others that uh, use exact Bayesian inference. This is work based on uh, uh, the results from a Finnish group around uh, Koivisto and Sud and Silander. And uh, they estimate the most likely uh, um, uh, graph, in fact, the directed acyclic graph, uh, given the data. And then you have to infer from that graph the equivalence class. But these kinds of graphs, at least in, uh, sorry, these types of algorithms, at least in the large sample limit, get you from the data to the Markov equivalence class under those, sets of, under those assumptions that uh, I've listed there. So then, for someone who works in causal methodology like I do, the, what is the aim of the game? Well, what you want to do is you, an equivalence class of causal structures is nice, but often we want to know something more about the detail of the causal structure. We want to get the orientations resolved. And then we might want to weaken the assumptions or generalize the assumptions or take different sets of assumptions. And then lastly, what you might also consider are the experimental conditions or observational conditions under which you've collected the data. And so uh, maybe you want to generalize those. And this goes to the, in the last talk where you talked about, well, in meta-analysis, we want to integrate data from different or results from different uh, um, conditions under which they were recorded. So you'd want to generalize, weaken, and reduce. And I apologize, it sounds a bit like Dick Cheney in this case. But um, so let's start with the bad news first. And for linear Gaussian and for multinomial causal relations, an algorithm that identifies the Markov equivalence class under the assumptions that are listed there is as good as it gets. It's complete. So in a certain sense, for those types of uh, um, parametric assumptions or causal relations that have those parametric assumptions with PC and the other uh, graphs that I mentioned, you are already getting as much causal information out as you can. And this goes back to results from Perl and Geiger and from to Meek in the case of uh, Chris Meek in the case of the multinomial relation. So what hope do we then have in order to find something out about what's going on within a Markov equivalence class, or which graph is the right one within the Markov equivalence class? Well, you try. there are a whole variety of ways that we could move forward. One is, well, we could weaken the assumptions and then take into account that our, equivalent, uh, that our set of graphs that, that we might get out might get larger. But so be it, at least we're, we're not making a false assumption then. So for example, we might allow for unmeasured common causes. We might, might allow for cyclic causal relations or for all of the above. The other way, which I think is an extremely interesting move that is, uh, is uh, very recent, is to say, well, let's exclude the limitations. So restrict ourselves to non-Gaussian error distributions or restrict ourselves to non-linear causal relations and then see whether we can actually get more precise information about the causal structure that, uh, than the Markov equivalence class. And then the last uh, option, uh, well, one other option is to say, well, let's include more general sources of data, try to integrate experiments, try to integrate instruments, uh, and see what we get in terms of uh, the causal structure from, from uh, this type of meta-analysis and combining results. OK, I want to talk a little bit about one of these options that says, well, let's, let's restrict, uh, let's exclude the, one of the limitations in particular. Let's exclude the case of Gaussian error terms. This has come up in various talks today already. This is the Lingam method due to uh, Shimizu et al., I think, first in 2006. And what's the idea here? The idea is that. Take a standard linear causal relation, as, as you might know it uh, from any old simple textbook, uh, where the effect depends linearly on a, uh, a, a, is a linear sum of the uh, value of its parents plus an exogenous error term. And under the assumption 
And so now, standardly, we assume that that error term is Gaussian distributed. But just take those error terms to be non-Gaussian and make the assumption of causal Markov causal sufficiency. So here we exclude the uh, uh, latent confounding and make the errors independent and assume that the cause underlying causal model is acyclic. And suddenly we get this amazing result that actually the true graph is uniquely identifiable. We're not only getting the Markov equivalence class, we can get the true graph uh, the true underlying graph back. Obviously, modulo sample size. I mean, if with finite sample size, we might not get the true graph immediately. But this is a remarkable uh, result in a certain sense, given that we knew that if the Gaussian terms were, uh, if the error terms were Gaussian, that we would only get the Markov equivalence class. We suddenly assume that the, Markov, that the error terms are anything but Gaussian, and we get identifiability. It's a remarkable result, and so you might obviously wonder why. What's going on underneath here? One other thing just before I say what's going on underneath is that this doesn't even require faithfulness. So you don't even have to uh, uh, make this type of simplicity assumption that works perfectly fine without faithfulness. OK, what's going on? Let me just give you a little bit of a sense of what's going on using just two variables, and we'll try to orient the, the causal edge between x and y in the correct way. Let's say the true model is that y depends on x in the way that I described. Uh, what does that end that, of course, our error terms in this case are non-Gaussian. What does, what does that mean about the, the model? Since we assume causal sufficiency, we know that the error terms are independent. And that means that in this graph, x and, uh, x and the error on the y variable are independent. Suppose we were mistakenly to fit a backwards model. Suppose we try to fit a backwards model where x depends on y. Then that would look like I write there, x is equal to theta y plus some other epsilon as error term on x. And we would want to have then that in order to satisfy all our assumptions that y is independent of that error term on x. What does that error term on x then look like? Well, we can substitute the original equation back in. That's all I've done there. I've substituted what y is into the equation and resorted the, the linear equation a bit. And what we see now is that we have, for y and for uh, epsilon x in this backwards model, we have a linear equation in two variables, namely an x and epsilon y, which are supposedly independent, right? So we've got two linear equations in the same variable, and we want uh, epsilon x and y to be independent. That's just what I said. Here, we go digging in our toolbox, and it come, we get the darmor skitovich theorem, which is an amazing theorem, as far as I'm concerned. It underlies exactly this Lingam procedure, and it underlies independent component analysis as well. What it says is that if you have, if you have um, two linear combinations of variables that are independent, all of them are independent, then those linear combinations of those variables uh, will only be independent if the xi are normally distributed. Now take the converse of that. We assume non-normality in, um, in, er in, the, in the error terms. That means that the only way y and epsilon x will be independent is if we can uh, that, that means that we cannot fit a backwards model such that y and epsilon x are independent. This is what underlies the un entire Lingam theory. Yeah. In practice, how Well, so now it's a measure of what can you test for how many samples. I'll get to that a little bit later, though I won't be able to give a precise answer. People who have worked in applications will tell you a lot more about that. But you notice that people have applied it and. Uh, seem to get reasonable results, but I'll say more, a little more about that. So the whole idea of the Lingam method really comes down to this remarkable theorem of, uh, of Damar Skitovich, and I think it's, uh, uh, it's quite amazing. Yeah. Um, no, so the, does the proof depend on the central? The proof is very difficult, and it depends on characteristic, uh, builds on characteristic functions. I don't have a full understanding of it. And the people I've asked about it could not give me any further intuition about how it works. I thought underlying was central. Well, well the problem, but the problem is not any two variables that you mix will necessarily be more Gaussian 
right? So, so you can mix two, two, two non-Gaussian variables and they will not necessarily be more Gaussian. Right? So, so that's why the, that's doesn't quite, that explanation doesn't quite work. But, uh, that this proof for the darmor skitovich theorem, I, I don't have a good grip on it. Okay. So uh, uh, non-Gaussianity, you exclude the Gaussian error terms and you get this remarkable result that you can identify the true graph um, uh, from the data. What does this mean? Let's think about uh, the types of algorithms we have and the different assumptions that they make. Then you're familiar with the PC algorithm. It assumes Markov faithfulness, causal sufficiency, acyclicity. It doesn't make a parametric assumption and what you get out is the Markov equivalence class. That type of algorithm has been generalized by dropping the assumption of causal sufficiency, allowing for uh, uh, latent variables, but therefore then you get a larger equivalence class which is described in, partial, in terms of partial ancestral graphs. That's the FCI algorithm. We saw that somewhere in the first talk this morning, I think. And then there is one a different algorithm developed by Thomas Richardson, the CCD algorithm, which assumes that there are no latent variables but permits for feedback loops. And you also get a, diff uh, a larger equivalence class, unsurprisingly, because you've weakened the assumptions from the PC algorithm. But now, if we look at the Lingam method, we don't have to assume faithfulness. We only have to make the parametric assumption that the errors are anything but Gaussian. And suddenly, we get the unique DAG out. And so uh, uh, we, we have a very, very um, remarkable uh, result there. And then. That type of result has been generalized to latent variables. Clark mentioned that somewhere this morning um, uh, that you can have these results, the, the you can apply the Lingam procedure even permitting for uh, uh, causal insufficiency, and, but you no longer get the unique DAG out. You get a relatively small set of DAGs out. It's uh, uh, not, not equivalent to a PAG. Um, and, uh, um, Alessio mentioned that uh, it's also been extended to cyclic graphs where you uh, can permit for feedback loops, but you can't have any type of latent confounding, and you also get a set of graphs out. Uh, and in that case, you, you don't have to assume faithfulness, but you, it helps, of course, in terms of identifying the model. So this gives a kind of contrast that only with adding the simple parametric assumption of non-Gaussianity on the error, you, you get this whole new set of algorithms that's uh, uh, excellent in identified stuff. So, a couple of questions. Okay, so, one, one kind of non Gaussian error is a mixture of a small variance normal and a big variance normal, but we might call an outlier. So, it seems like you want outliers in some cases in order to derive this process, which, uh, as a statistician, seems a little bit counterintuitive. Yeah, so, so this goes back to, so, yes. That's, uh, that's at risk, it certainly, uh, uh, but it depends on how you measure the non-Gaussianity. So, so one measure that Lingam can build on is kurtosis, and that's going to be very sensitive to outliers. Uh, and, that, so, and then that would not be a good, so then you would run exactly into the kinds of worries that you might have as a statistician. Another way that has been used is to use negative entropy, and that is not as sensitive to outliers. Uh, uh, or at least not in the same way as uh, kurtosis is. And uh, that's about all I can say about it because I've not uh, explored that in detail myself. But it's, it's, if you look at the paper by uh, Apo Hiveren, and I, think, I, I can give you a reference that discusses exactly this issue of outliers in detail. <coughs> Um, I mean a set of directed graphs with cycles. Uh, I do not mean ancestral graphs. Yes. I obviously don't mean DAGs because it allows for cycles. But yes, thank you. Okay, let's go back. So we looked at this case now. Exclude the limitation with regard to Gaussianity, right? So that's one way of getting more identifiability. Well, there's a different way as well. Let's, ex let's exclude the limitation due to linearity. So just consider nonlinear cases. So let's first 
use the standard linear Gaussian case again and think through that one. Here's an example, the true model is given there and assume that the, that the error terms are independent Gaussians. Then you might get a scatter plot like that. And what does that look like? If you look at the forwards model and look at the conditional probability of y given x, you've got some nice Gaussians depending on the value of x. And if you consider the probability of x given y, which would be relevant to fitting your backwards model, uh, then you also get these Gaussians that just are all this of the same form and just depend on the value of x that, uh, 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 that uh, sorry, on the value of y that you've chosen. So here you can kind of see that, well, if you had a bivariate linear Gaussian case, then you can fit a forward and a backwards model. This is uh, just as we would expect, and we don't get identifiability of the causal direction. Now, do the, now think about somewhat more general functional forms where x depends on its parents through some general function, and we add in an exogenous noise term. We can then ask a whole bunch of questions. Well, first we know if it's linear, then we need non-Gaussian errors on the error term in order to achieve identifiability. That was the Lingam result right, that I just presented before. What if the errors are Gaussian, but the function that relates the parent uh, to the variable to its parents is nonlinear? Can we do something else with regard to identifiability? More generally, we can ask what circumstances uh, have to hold for the function in order for the graphical structure to be identifiable? What is the relation between the error distribution and the functions uh, that relates parents to the variable that has to hold in order for the model to be identifiable? Well, let's take a nonlinear function. Here's the true model. I've put a cube in there. Well, I haven't put a cube in there. Patrick Hoyer put a cube in there uh, in the original, and I nicked the uh, uh, graphics from him. Um, and this is what the scatter plot would look like. Suppose that the true model is that y depends on x and x cubed. And suppose, moreover, that the error terms still remain, the error terms still remain independent Gaussians. Okay? Now, what does the forwards model look like? As we expect, the error terms are independent Gaussian, so we just see the Gaussian uh, in the probability of y given x, and it just depends on what x value you choose, and it doesn't matter, the shape is exactly the same. Interestingly, if you try to fit the backwards model to this, so, and lo then look at x given y, you see that depending on the value of y, the distributions look quite different. This suggests that, well, what, uh, the, the y is not independent of the error anymore, but it should be. That was the assumption of the model class. So then it means that if we can have a nonlinear uh, uh, functional relation, we can actually orient the causal direction between these two variables because we can see in which case do we have an independent error and in which case do we not. Have, do we have an independent error in the forwards model or do we have an independent error in the backwards model? What's the general case? Well, so the general case is a very, very technical condition that I did not put up because it wouldn't help you in understanding any of it, so I call it the Hoyer et al. condition, hetalic. Yes, I will refer to it as that. It's a technical condition on the relation between the function, the noise distribution, and the parent distribution that if the function and the uh, noise distribution satisfy that this complicated condition, then a backwards model is possible. Now we get the results. If the error terms are Gaussian, then the only functional form that satisfies this technical condition is linearity. Otherwise, the model is identifiable. So this is, again, remarkable. You exclude anything, you, you, the only thing, sorry, anything but linearity. So the only thing you exclude is linearity. And suddenly, you get identifiability back again. This is under the assumption of independent errors. But they needn't be Gaussian. Okay. If the errors are non-Gaussian, then there are rather contrived functions that satisfy this condition, and so they, there you would be able to fit a backward model. But in general, for most ordinary functions which, have, uh, uh, which are continuous and differentiable, in general, identifiability is guaranteed. It's, it's, again, I think, just an absolutely remarkable result that with the linear Gaussian case, you know, we've been sitting in a corner where things just don't work. The moment you move away in any direction from the linear Gaussian case, you get identifiability. 
Okay, this generalizes to multiple variables. I just showed you the case of two vari the, the bivariate case before. The, if you generalize to multiple variables, you have to assume minimality, which is a somewhat weaker, uh, well, you have to assume minimality in a few other technical conditions, but uh, that's a somewhat weaker condition uh, than faithfulness. And uh, you, we can even generalize this type of result to additive, a discrete additive noise model, so um, we don't even need uh, uh, to stick to um, uh, continuous distributions. Okay, if the function is linear, but the error terms are non-Gaussian, then one can't fit a linear backwards model. That's what Lingam says. But sometimes there are cases where one can fit a non-linear backwards model. So uh, those are also very spe specific cases, but uh, in a certain sense, we don't need to worry about those. So what do we look like? This is the table we had before. Let's add to it the nonlinear additive Gauss uh, noise case. We assume minimality instead of faithfulness. We assume causal sufficiency and acyclicity and only make the assumption that we have non, a nonlinear function uh, but that relates the variables and we have additive noise, then we can identify the unique directed acyclic graph again. So this is just a summary of what I've said, uh, the point that I've made all along. Okay, how am I doing for time? Okay, I'll need 10, but okay. <laughs> okay, the, the last point then that I want to make is let's consider somewhat more general uh, circumstances of experiments and overlapping data sets, meta-analytic cases. So uh, for, uh, you've seen either this morning or before what, what experiments look like. Uh, you intervene in, in the at least in the strongest sense, uh, you intervene on an, a variable y by, say, randomizing it or fixing it, which means you break the incoming causal relations to it. And that can be incoming causal relations from an observed variable or from an unobserved variable. Um, so then we can ask lots of, uh, lots of questions about identifiability, like for example, what, which experiments should we perform? How should we integrate the results from experimental data into the results that we already have? And what search space assumptions are still required uh, in order to get things, uh, uh, in order to achieve identifiability? Okay, here's something that uh, I have worked on with colleagues recently, and uh, uh, we have started using uh, satisfiability solvers following uh, Yanis uh, Tsamardino's lead, um, where we look at, suppose you just have some source where you get your graphical constraints from. It might be from a Lingam-based algorithm, it might be from an additive noise algorithm, it might be from PC or from background knowledge. You might have knowledge of the type that X is a cause of Y, you don't know whether direct or indirect, or you might know that there is a path from X to Y. Maybe you know that it has to go via Z, maybe not. Uh, X and Y are independent. That would be something you could get from the PC algorithm or, or from an independence test. Or X and Y are correlated conditional on the set of variables in C in an experiment where you've intervened on X. Right? That would be a, a, a kind of general constraint which we can in a certain way spell out graphically. So take graphical constraints like this, turn them into propositional constraints in a conjunctive normal form that a, satisfi that a satisfiability solver can eat. Um, send these types of constraints to a SAT solver and then use the SAT solver to see how much you can identify about the underlying causal structure. And then maybe, uh, you, depending on how much you find, you might go back and say, what further graphical constraints can I get from somewhere or from background knowledge and then integrate those and go around the loop again. So now I have to tell you, of course, well, how do I get these graphical constraints into propositional constraints? Let me first tell you a couple of things about a satisfiability solver. I'm sure most of you have seen these things before. The general idea of a satisfiability solver is that it finds a truth value assignment for a Boolean formula that is given in conjunctive normal form. Um, what will we use the satisfiability solver for? We use it as to compute the backbone of a particular formula. What does that mean? A Boolean term x is a backbone variable if x takes the same value, either true or false, in all satisfying truth value assignments of a given formula. So basically you want to look at all the solutions and look at those parts, those terms that are the same, have the same truth value in all the solutions. Then, you, then that term is in the backbone of the variable. Okay, 
So how does the encoding of a graphical constraint work? Let's take a very general graphical constraint. Let's just look at a dependence. So with this notation, I mean that x is dependent on y given the conditioning set C in an intervention, in an experiment where I've intervened on the variables in J. Okay, so I've got everything. I've got conditioning sets. I can, I, I'm intervening on other variables. The conditioning sets and the intervening variables may overlap. That's, uh, they don't have to be exclusive. Okay, what could that mean? Well, now we just have to ask, well, what does a dependence mean in causal terms? Well, it means that you have one of four types of paths. Either there is a path from x to y, there's a path from y to x, or there's a common cause between x and y, or there is a common effect between x and y that you've conditioned on such that you have tails of the paths at both x and y. But then, of course, some variable in the middle has to be in the conditioning set to create the dependence. So we can just turn that into a logical formula and say, consider all possible paths from, of any length. Let's ignore the maximum length for the moment. Uh, between these uh, two variables. Then there are four types of paths. What do these mean? We can just break them down further. A path from x to y of length l means that either you have an edge from x to z and then a path of from z to y of length l minus 1, as long as z is not in the conditioning set, because otherwise, it would have if, if z were in the conditioning set, you would have broken the dependence. Or if z is in the conditioning set, then a path from x to y uh, dependence can only arise from that type of path if you uh, uh, condition on the variable that's, that, that is a collider. Similarly, you can do it for the other paths, and I uh, guess since I'm out of time, I, I won't go through the details. The point is that ultimately, when you recursively define these types of paths, you can bottom out in what the constraints imply for the graph that must be underlying the, uh, uh, the data that you've uh, generated. So you've got a kind of recursive definition of the dependence in terms of the constraints that it puts on a path. Now this is a disjunctive uh, normal form, but uh, there are easy conversions from disjunctive normal forms to conjunctive normal forms, so you can feed this type of thing to a SAT solver. This is what it would look like in general, but I, uh, that's just the technical notation. I want to say one thing about the length of paths. We want to consider causal graphs that allow for cycles. So in principle, the length of paths could be infinite, but it turns out there's a very nice proof based on deseparation relations that shows that actually one only has to consider a finite length of path, even if there are cycles along the way. The, the basic idea is that if you've got a long path that goes around a loop a lot of times, then there also has to be a shorter path that just goes around the loop once. Right? That's, that's the basic thought. Um, I'm close to out of time. Is that the idea? That's really it. Okay. Well, I keep going then. Um, if, if we have these types of graphical constraints, then we can have a fairly simple algorithm. Um, we just find the unknown independence and dependence relations among a set of variables and determine those by some, some independence uh, test. We encode those re relations in the way that I was suggesting before as, as constraints in a SAT solver. And then we can determine the backbone of those constraints, which means we can determine all those edges that are present in all the solutions that satisfy the constraints, all those edges that are absent in all the solutions uh, that satisfy the constraints, or those edges that are unknown. So what's nice about it, we can encode any type of background knowledge that is uh, uh, representable using the encoding. So uh, if you know something about tier ordering, about particular paths that are present or absent, then, then this is very simple to encode as a graphical constraint on the system. Um, you can treat independence and dependence constraints separately from one another. You might be confident that you have an independence, but if you don't have an independence, you might not be confident that you have a dependence. So you can treat them uh, uh, separately as you please. And uh, maybe you don't care about p whether there is a particular edge present, but you care about whether a particular path is present. So then you can just so ask the SAT solver for, is this path present, rather than asking, whether a particular edge is present. So in a certain sense, this is, this, the aim that, that we were after in, gen, in writing this algorithm was to really provide a general purpose, 
procedure where you can integrate knowledge from all sorts of different sources. So that is reflected then in the type of, um, uh, uh, in, in the assumptions that it makes. We, we only have to make very weak assumptions. We do make the assumption of faithfulness, but we don't. And this is where Clark was wrong earlier today. He said there's no such algorithm as one that assumes causal sufficient, that does not assume causal sufficiency nor acyclicity. Well, this algorithm assumes neither. Uh, though with acyclicity, if you allow for cyclic causal relations, we of course need to be exactly clear what the interpretation of the cycle is, right? Uh, what is the, are we talking about equilibrium distributions or, or a time series or, or what is it? We d the algorithm doesn't require any type of parametric assumption. So if you can make the parametric assumption and get your results from Lingam or from, from the additive noise model, great, we'll throw that in and uh, uh, use it. In terms of the output, it really depends on what type of constraints go in. And so the view that we've taken is that we don't give an output in terms of a graph or an equivalence class or anything like that, but ask us the question that you want to know. We'll encode it as a graphical constraint and ask whether it holds or not or whether we just don't know. So it's a query-based approach because the equivalence class in general, if you have this type, if you make assumptions that are this weak, is just too large to, to be representable. Um, there's one more thing then that I just want to mention with regard to application then is that I think PC and uh, uh, GES and all these algorithms are in very wide use and FCI I was glad to see has, has some, some use. I'm not aware of any use of the CCD, the cyclic causal discovery algorithm. Lingam I also was glad to see is in, in great use already in economics. Uh, uh, it's obviously used in its variants a lot in fMRI data. Um, what I would want to say about the latent variable Lingam is that uh, even speaking with the authors of that algorithm, the impression is that that is actually not very good with regard to small sample sizes. So you need enormous sample sizes before you can generalize there. The cyclic Lingam is, works, works fine on fMRI data. And then the nonlinear additive noise stuff is really taking off, I think. That's really new stuff and the applications are, are getting going. The SAT stuff is still in development. Uh, I, 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 I'll say, in development rather than not in use because I, that's my horse in this race. Um, uh, uh, but it is in fact still in development, it's very new. Okay, thank you very much. Let me just emphasize one thing here, some references, and we've only made it to slide 30, okay, of uh, uh, Waymo. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. So, uh, I, I, you, you great. I, I will. I, I was changing the slide during the day already. <laughs> yeah, go on. Um, the, I think there's a, another important assumption that uh, we all make, but it's not really understood, and that is that uh, we assume that we measure the variables with no error. Uh, because if we don't make this assumption, then uh, I don't think the causal market condition holds necessarily. But in this particular important in applications in biology where there, there is a lot of error in the measurements. Um, so, so two things. In, in one sense, I would want to say, well, there are procedures that use indicator variables to infer uh, latent structure, right? So where, where, where you kind of say, okay, I have a noisy measurement of my variable, but I'm interested in the, the, the true variable uh, um, uh, uh, that I can't observe. So this is stuff by Ricardo da Silva uh, and Richard, actually, um, uh, that, that goes into that. And so I, I, th I think there are actually some procedures that speak to that. And those were on, you know, slide 50 to 105. But um, uh, in a different sense, I think your, your uh, point is exactly right, is that um, no, not only do we assume that we uh, don't measure the variables with, without error, but that we have the right variables in a certain sense to start off with, that, that those are actually real causal variables. And so there's this paper by Peter and Richard on uh, ambiguous manipulations where you, know, you, you think that you're measuring the co right causal variable by measuring total cholesterol, but in fact what is the c correct causal level to measure would be LDL and HDL, which have opposing effects on heart disease. And so how do we know that we've got the right variables when we're measuring, especially in economics or fMRI? Um, I think that's a huge problem.
yeah, and, and very interesting area to work on. But, but uh, I mean, it's not something that uh, when you see an application that people are consciously thinking about. Yeah, that's yeah. No, I, I take your point. Yeah. Um, I was curious about the configuration of passengers that I was going to just ask because I'm in a situation where even PC is slow for me, and FCI is also a question. And so, how do these different adverts stack up in terms of configuration complexity? Uh, I will not be able to answer that in, in all detail for them. So, so my, my general guess would be that if PC starts getting complicated, then, then you're moving into an area where uh, various other approaches that I haven't even talked about here uh, uh, need to come in. But uh, yeah, I'm not even going to venture a proper stacking up of that. That's the, the, the all, I mean, these references, if you look at these references, the people do actually talk about the computational complexity, but that's not something I checked in detail. I'm sorry. Okay. One more quick, is it quick? <coughs> it's quick. I will also note that the, the mother assumption is that we have independent identity distributed entities. Yeah, so, you, you, I mean, you've done all this work on the relational stuff at slide 150 to 200. Uh, no, but I'm quite serious. I mean, look, there, there are so many things that I've omitted. So there's the relational uh, causal stuff. There's all, I didn't say anything about other time series based uh, things or anything with uh, time components in them. Uh, so so uh, don't fault me for omission. That's, uh, uh, there's enormous omission here.